Tub Talks with Damon, season four. This is the season beginning four. of the new season. Oh, am I your first? You are the season premiere. Oh, I thought this was going to squeak. I got excited. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's that lovely. I'm finally in, in the tub with you. It is a great way to kick off the fourth year of this series, which four I am so excited about. Yes. I am here with the legendary entertainment reporter, activist, speaker, and all around inspiration, Carl Schmidt. Welcome. Thank you for Welcome having me. Welcome to Tub Talks. Thank you. It's lovely to be in the Tub Talks. Thank you for hosting me in Los Angeles in this gorgeous it's tub. Nice. I'm so grateful. I wish this. I could claim it was mine, but it's not. It's my friends. Thank you to the friends Thank you, Chris. who made this happen. Thank, Thank you, Chris. You Chris. Yes. Um, Carl, the first question mm -hmm. I ask all my guests on yeah. all the episodes is, what do you like most about your body? What do I like most? Like my favorite feature? Yeah. Or, um, when you I think about your body, body you say my, calf, my calf Ooh. muscles. Let's see the caps. Those are really well, is it, that would Oh, be, that's like solid muscle. I think it's called them shoulder pads. But solid. yes, I would say those wow. are my nose. Those are my nose. What do you like about those? Um, I don't have to do any work on yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> They're just a natural gift. Uh -huh. And I get compliments, and who doesn't like to be given a compliment? Yeah. 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 So people compliment your caps. They I get, look at your caps. They're like, oh, you must be a runner, and I'm like, no, I hate running. It's one of those. It's one of those annoying genetic things. You know, like you see people and you're like, oh, wow, and they're like, yeah, I can eat whatever I want, I can drink whatever I want, and you're like, bitch, <laughs> screw you. Um, that's like my calves. I really don't have to do anything for them, wow. so I'm very lucky. Thank you. Parents. Now, when do people see your calves? Because most of the time you're doing interviews, you're standing or you're speaking. Mm. Do people generally get to see your calves very often? Uh, um, it depends. I do like to wear a short. Uh -huh. I'm a short wearer. And we are in California and we're in Los Angeles. So oh, the yes. weather is hot all the time. So that is true. Uh, a lot of the time I do that cheeky thing where I wear all the good stuff on top. Uh -huh. And then I wear a pair of shorts. Wow. Um, so I'm in shorts a lot, you know. Uh, yeah, that's what they say, I guess. Beautiful. Beautiful. This is such an exciting interview. When I created this series, yeah. you were definitely one of the first what? people I thought of at the top of the Why list. Why did you make... I, we have to... Th you, this is one of those baths with a bath that is... is, is is the water is going down? So oh, every now and then, because I don't, yeah, I'm, re it. I'm reaching down there, Damon. I don't, oh. wanna, I don't want to get you stuck oh, in the. Okay. Oh, there it is. Oh, see, okay. we're we're pushing our plug. That, oh, there we go. That sounded a bit wrong. But can I? I'm going to top it <laughs> yeah. off. Yeah. Let's let, let's is let's start down? the season by topping it off. Yeah. So here, top it off for me, Carl. Oh, there you go. Get, oh. You need to get wet, Damon. That's a. Uh, you can't be in the tub. You can top me off all you want. There you go. It feels very good. Um, I'm well, loving this. What, We're off to a great start. I should, you're asking the questions, but I can't help myself. <laughs> what made you come up with this idea? Well, as you have experienced yourself, we do a lot of interviews, sometimes on a red carpet, sometimes at conferences, and a lot of times they tend to be prepared with sound bites, yep. short answers, sort of remain on the surface. And during COVID, once we started getting vaccines yes. that became available in New York City, and once I turned 50 years old, mm. I realized that I wanted to have real conversations, in-depth, long-held conversations with naked people. And that I didn't want to do any more of the bullshit red carpet, which I still sometimes yeah. do. But for the most part, I wanted to talk about the people who inspire me, the leaders, the in, uh, activists, the educators, and so many people in New York, the entertainers and the artists, who have shaped and changed our lives. And sometimes the people who aren't writing the books about this. Right. The people who have nevertheless been in the trenches for 30, 40 years, yeah. working so hard to make our world a happier, healthier place. I wanted a spot like them naked. And here we are. And here we are. And so the bathtub, you just went, the bathtub is it. And I was like, I have a bathtub in Brooklyn, which yeah. I rarely ever use. Why not do it? Why? And now you can make your bathroom a tax run. Yes. I thought I turned this Yeah, there you go. So that, that's, that's my it. short answer that's to that. That's okay. All right. And, Sorry, and, I won't ask any more questions. It also means that if we as educators mm. want to work with people that who are might be vulnerable, right, and we want to help them understand HIV, U equals U, and PrEP, and all the means by which we have pleasure, that means we need need to be willing to be vulnerable ourselves. Very I true. I think so. Which I think you have been exemplary, exemplary, exemplary of doing is, is being so open and honest about your life experience and your story in ways that have helped, I don't know, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Well, it, I think I mean, I'm being very I, accurate. No, well, yeah. I mean, I don't think, 
certainly when I've talked about my truth or you know I've spoken about my own personal experiences it's never in the back of my head thinking oh I hope I'm you know it's just me being honest I guess because that great old saying if you always tell the truth you don't have to remember anything that's true um, but you're right a wonderful a wonderful byproduct of me having a big mouth and a big yap and liking to talk and sometimes liking to talk about myself yes means that hopefully and I guess that's why we start a plus like too hopefully that someone sees or hears something that I might say that they go hmm I can relate to that right and, that, and you're right that's, right that's really helpful now when you I know you grew up in Australia yes we're for the first 10 years of my life for the first ten, okay you are the youngest of three brothers I've got yes two older brothers correct right. were you always interested in doing interviews and talking with people and being on camera was that something that came naturally to you as a child? Um, no, apparently I was quite a shy kid. Really? Yeah, as a little one. Uh -huh. um, but my middle brother, Christian, when I was seven, he got cast on a very popular Australian television show. Um, the same show that launched the careers of people like Kylie Minogue and Guy Pearce. Uh -huh. and Russell Crowe, yeah. It was a soap opera called Neighbours. Okay. And in the 80s, it was the biggest thing on Australian television. Right. And it was even bigger in Europe. It wasn't, wasn't big, it wasn't on here in America, but... Right. but in Europe and everywhere else, it was like the biggest thing on television. Right. And he got cast on that. And that was on Prime Time, right? Prime Time, yeah, no, it was, it was a Prime, prime, time, time, prime show. time show. Yeah. Like at 6.30 or 7 o'clock, yeah. five, five nights a week. Yeah. In England, it aired twice a day. Um, and anyone who was on that show became like a, a mega rock star. Um, I remember when I was about 10, it was the first time we went to London with my brother who was doing promotional work. And it was, I'm not kidding, thousands of screaming fans and, and security detail. And I mean, it was Beatles kind of S. Wow. And, and you know, to be a 10 year old and sort of be exposed to that, it's kind of, it was a double edged sword. It was cool because I was getting these amazing experiences, but I also then um, got bullied quite a bit for it at school. Because of your brother's group. Yeah, but it was sort of a you think you're better than all of us kind of thing. Mm. And, you know, I'm sure there was a bit of arrogance on my part too but but what got me interested was i he would take me to work some days and i would go to the set of the show and i remember he'd be you know these giant sound stages and when you take a soap opera all the sets are all constructed side by side it's so that the cameras can just swing around they can go well, now we're finished filming here now we're doing the next thing here so you're in this warehouse and it's in, it's a bit like going to IKEA. You know when you walk through IKEA, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit rooms, yeah, different it's a bit sets. like that. Yeah. But I'd sort of grown up watching the show, going, oh, I'm in Jim Robinson's house, or now I'm in the coffee shop, and now, and he would be working way down the other end of the stage, and I was just left as a ten year old to just explore, and I would just kind of like it was. They all look so real, but it's all make believe, and I think that's when the interest for me sort of came in, and then of course. You know what kid brother doesn't want to do cool stuff like his big brother so that's kind of where that came from I guess and then I got in drama class and did things like that and yeah how did that then come to be um, what was the bridge between that and becoming an entertainment news reporter so I was we my, I moved around a bit yeah. um, I, and, and when I was 11 I think we moved to Fiji for a while and then we moved to New Zealand when I was 13 and in New Zealand, I started working on a show called What Now, which I think is still on the air. It was Saturday morning live television. And I got cast on that show just sort of to be in the background a little bit. It was a three hour live television show. And over the course of my high school years, I did more and more and more on that show. Um, and that's really what started it. And then I went away from it all. When I graduated, I graduated high school and did all of that. Then I went and traveled and then I went and worked in production management and event management and all kinds of other things and then when that was all done I sort of I was living in London and producing television and I would come here a lot I had friends in Los Angeles and a couple of friends were like why don't you do the hosting thing anymore and I was like you know like I did it and you have to be hungry you know this you have to want it you have to really want it because it's not easy it's tough and I didn't think I really wanted it, you know, the, the drive wasn't there. And then I went back to London and I just thought more about it and I was seeing someone here in LA and I thought, you know, why don't I give it one more shot? These guys who are friends in LA, who are very well connected in the business, 
I respect. And they seem to think, maybe I could do it. And so I came back out and I took some meetings. The first one was the TV Guide Network. Uh, and I said, well, if you ever do anything big in London, let me know. And they so happened they were doing a, a big James Bond premiere. So TV Guide Network hired me based out of London to host a special. And then that snowballed. And then I thought, you know, I don't want to be the person who looks over his shoulder one day and says, I wonder what if, I wonder what, and regret it. And so that was it. I, I, I you know, threw caution to the wind and came here and the rest is history. Wow, okay. Now I also want to go back to an anecdote that you've shared mm. about what it was like when you were seven years old yeah. and taken to see the movie Harry and the Hendersons. Yes. And uh, you, in saying. Australia, yep. described that before the movie would play, yeah. right, there was like a public service, they would run the public service Yeah, ads. and commercials. And commercials. And Something like they do now. Yeah. But they're, yes. So let's talk about what happened when you were seven years old mm -hmm. and went to see Harry and the Hendersons as a child, and what was the public service announcement that came on the screen? Yeah, it was a campaign that ran in Australia called the Grim Reaper. The campaign. Grim Reaper. I don't know. Maybe you'll in the US. US. Here. The funny thing is, is like every time I talk to somebody from Australia, this is a traumatizing That's experience. <laughs> in the US, we don't know it, but I'm going to put a clip. Put so a clip to it. Right it's now. available but on YouTube. It's, it's terrifying. terrifying. It's, it's, it's it, to me, it's funny, but as a child, that would not have been funny to watch this. It is not funny, but it is. Listen, funny. I've been in touch with Simon Reynolds, the guy who created it. I want to do something with him. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the Grim Reaper is, in, is a was an advertisement that was made as a public service to talk about AIDS. Yeah. And it starts off with these very doom and gloom, and you hear this scary voice that says, "At first, it was just the gays and drug users." But now, we, anybody can get AIDS. Innocent and, people, the and, Yeah, and I was seven years, and it, it goes to the point, I was seven years old, it was Saturday, and I was at the Greater Union Cinema on Russell Street. I'm now 44 years old almost, but I can, that's how, and I get goosebumps, that's how searing that messaging was. And it was this ad that basically showed human beings as pins in a bowling alley. And there was a woman holding a baby, and there was a little girl, and there was a family, and they, they're all like pins, and they get dropped down onto the thing, and then the Grim Reaper comes with a bowling ball, and bowls, and all these people shatter, and break, and die. And it was this really powerful lab that basically said, you know, if you don't use a condom and everything else, you're going to die of AIDS. Uh, and, and, that, and then Harry and the Hendersons, <laughs> my dad, then followed. But the fact that, as I said, I'm almost 44, that that is so clear in my mind. I can still smell the theater. I could, the, the, the drapes were like a golden orange. I, can, I mean, I can picture the whole thing. Um, and do you even remember the movie or just the I do remember, say? I know, I do remember bits. Okay, of, okay. I do remember bits. It's John Lithgow, uh, it's very good in that film. Um, but yeah, no, it was, and, then, and that, it, it, that, it, that campaign ended up getting pulled because it was so frightening. It was meant to run for a period of months and, and it got yanked like after maybe only a couple of weeks. And I know that it aired in places in Europe. I think it aired in the UK. Mm -hmm. I know it aired in New Zealand. But yes, the Grim Reaper. And so we, often when you talk to Australians about HIV, they go, oh yeah, the Grim Reaper. And it is a testament to Simon Reynolds and what he created. Because look, it was 1987. We didn't know what this thing was, certainly in Australia. Um, and they thought, okay, the only way we can really get a grip of this with the public is to scare them, you know, out of them. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. The problem is, and I've said this to Simon and many others, we have now not undone that. You know, we've not kept up with the times. And so with you equals you and all the great stuff we're doing uh, that you do and that I do and that activists all over the world, and, um, we, the Grim Reaper is still so seared. And I, I desperately want to take Simon Reynolds and say, okay, that's what you did in 1987 with the information you had there. Mm. Want to try it again. Do you want to see if you can, yeah. if you want to see if you can strike gold twice? Yeah. And why, and, and, because he said, it's interesting, you read articles and interviews he gives, he's very proud of that. And, and part of me wants to smack him in the head. And the other part of me goes, well, he was an ad man and he did his job. And at the time, that's what it was. But we have not, moved on with the times. So then, 
What did that do to your psyche in terms of beginning to have desires for other men and beginning to become a sexual person with that Grim Reaper in your, your psyche? Um, you know, I was unfortunately sexualized at a very young age. Um, I'm a, a, a survivor of, you know, sexual assault from, no, I'm sorry, I mean, from a, from a very young age, from three and then throughout periods of my life, sadly. I mean, as late as recent as in my 20s, I was raped. Um, only something I talked about recently. But um, so my psyche and my, my view towards sex and sexuality, unfortunately, has been fucked up to use horror. Yeah. You can bleep that if you have to. Yeah, no, um, we can say it's you two we can do. Yeah, and so I guess the Grim Reaper, you know, yes. We knew, I, I, it was, I was aware of it. But I don't think it in of itself, and I don't think HIV and AIDS frightened me so much. Because I think also a lot of the sexual experiences I was having as I was sort of coming up and developing as a young person were with other very young people my age. Now that's naive to think that, okay, they weren't having sex with but But I, I think it was more in my peer group age range. Mm -hmm. So I felt relatively naively secure, I guess. Is that a way to put it? Um, but I, but the, but the shame of it, and the, uh, let's put it this way: I, when I was diagnosed and I had to tell my parents, the first, like, there were two things: the red digital countdown clock I've talked about went off over my head, and the second was how could I do this to my parents? And you were twenty-seven. I was twenty-seven, and and when I came out as gay at eighteen to my parents, my mother said, you know, I think that's fine. And she said, please just don't get AIDS. Yeah. And then my parents said exactly the same thing. And it's an understandable comment. Yeah. You know, it's an, I can understand. I mean, I'm not yeah. a parent, but I can understand yeah. that. And because their grip on it was yeah. much more real. Do you know what's so interesting? What you're saying is so regularly, and what I was thinking hmm. is so regularly shared both in my um, in these personal and public, private life. Right. Is that that fear that we often have with HIV and AIDS wasn't even so much about HIV and AIDS mm -hmm. as it was disappointing my parents. Yeah, yeah disappointing. I've already put them through so much by coming out as gay. Now I have to put them through this. And yeah. that's often been so much of the trauma and the fear of getting that diagnosis. Yeah, and, it, and that's because society is even still right now. We've done something wrong because you should have known better, because you saw those commercials from the age of seven saying you should always wear a condom and you should never do drugs and you should, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I should know better. I should have, I mean, I should have known better. Um, and what a horrible thing, because sex is, 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 is as natural as breathing and going to the bathroom. It's actually the one thing we all really do have in common, even with the plants. Most of us are here because two people fucked. Some people did something into a tube, but it was still sexual. So, yet we stigmatize sex so much, especially in this country. You know, right. I mean, it's the big bad wolf. Right. So, when you tested positive yep. for HIV at 27, mm -hmm. this I believe was in London yep. at the Dean Clinic. Yeah. Uh, was there anyone that you could talk to about what you were feeling and what you were thinking and the shame you were carrying about this? About, you know, having seen these green, grim reaper ads and still becoming HIV positive at any time? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very... Sorry. sorry. <laughs> Just come on to the water. Put the plug, Let's get back to the Put the plug place. back in, Diana. <laughs> I'm very lucky. I have an amazing family that's in, that has always been incredibly supportive. So one of the first people I called that day was my brother, who was living in Poland at the time. This, my this old, old, the oldest one. Okay. And he, was, he said, you know, on Friday, go to the airport, there's a plane ticket to come here. And then we together told my parents. Um, so I'm really lucky in that regard. And also, I, I had left to go and get tested. Work, I took, I stepped out for like 20 minutes. So I had to go back to work. And, and what was the job you had at the time? I was an agent and a producer okay. um, for television producer. Okay, like, did you have to go on camera and smile? No, I didn't, have, no I didn't have to do any of that. Okay. But I, I went back to my office wow. and I, there was, the, my office was on the top floor of the building. Um, and there was a conference room on the ground floor and I went into the conference room and picked up the phone and I called my colleague upstairs and I said, can you come down here for a minute? And she came down and I told her. Um, and then we went upstairs and I just told my colleagues. I said, we were a very small, tight team. 
And I said, What's and then work stopped, and we, we had a <laughs> We had a bar in our office, uh -huh. and we had a fully stocked fridge with plenty of booze, and we all just stopped, and we went up to the roof of the building with bottles of wine, and we all just sat on the roof and talked. And then I have to say that, you know, the Dean Street Clinic and the, the care I got in London was phenomenal, and, and in the sense of, you weren't put on meds straight away back then in, in England. You were, right. you were left, your body was doing its job, so we're not gonna put you on treatment. That's changed. But, Getting me into counselling and everything couldn't have sort of been easier. And I realised how lucky and fortunate I was to be in London and be part of a national health service, something we don't have in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and because when, when certain members of our community hear the word socialised, they panic and freak out and think Nazis and horrible things. But it's funny because they still want their social security check. So mm -hmm. they have no problem with getting their social they security check. They want free COVID tests and, they and an STI test. But, but they yeah. won't have, we won't have socialized healthcare, which means, let's be honest, I've got to pay $10 more for a bottle of absolute vodka at the supermarket and you have to pay more for your cigarettes. You're taxed on things like that. But it also means that when I get run over in the street and the ambulance comes, I don't have to tell the ambulance driver, please don't touch me, I can't afford. Or if my child gets sick, I don't have to decide, do I go bankrupt or do I take 12 jobs? You know, there's something to be said for a socialized national absolutely, healthcare system. Absolutely. And having that meant that I didn't have to jump through a million hoops. I didn't have to, whereas in this country, I think about all the young people who are diagnosed, who are in the closet, um, who are on their parents' insurance, and they get this news and we say, yeah, get on treatment, get on treatment, undetectable equals untransmittable, life is great. But where do they even start if, they don't, if they're not out to their parents and how do you get that with it? Immediately, the hoops you have to jump through. Right. And then if you don't even have that and you know you've got an ADA, which is a great system, it's a million more hoops to jump through. Right. So I realize how Not to mention the men limited mental health services available yes. for people going through everything you've described when they receive that. And news. then we throw in all the race issues and everything else yeah. that this country has and the and, and religion. Religion and, and the way yep. even in sadly in the health care system here, um, you know, people, doctors and nurses are just as stigmatizing oh, yeah. and just as nasty towards our, our trans community and oh, everything yeah. else. So I'm very fortunate that it happened to me then and there in that country. Wow, okay. So you got the news, mm -hmm. you had some support. Yeah. How, how did your parents react when you told them? Uh, obviously upset. I mean, they cried, but it was interesting. You know, I, I said this before too. I think that, I think for those of, when, those of us being diagnosed, it's not easy, but it's easier than the family around us because it's our body and we're in control, right? So when I got the news, it was I didn't want the news, but I got the news and it was like, okay, that's what it is. What do I do now, doctor? What do I do next? And and I'm I've sort of been very pragmatic in that for most of it. And when so when I told my parents, I said, look, we can sit and we can cry and we can say what if and why not, how come and how could you be? And I said, and you're more than welcome to do all of that and that's fine and let that all out. I said, but at the end of the day, it is not gonna change what's happened. This is what's happened. This is what it is. And this is what it's gonna be moving forward. So yes, we can cry all we want and sit on the floor and have a tantrum, healthy, but eventually you're gonna to have to dry up the tears, wipe off the snotty face, pick yourself up, and go. And I, I was like, so now we educate ourselves and we do everything, we just take it one step at a time, no one step. And that's, you know, for the most part, in that regard, it's how I've dealt with it. That's not to say I haven't run off the rails and done stupid shit either. But that's more, that was more the internalized stigma. Oh, you know, the, the, the oh, well, you don't want me on damaged goods, ha 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 ha, joke that I would make. And I didn't realize until, you know, I came out publicly about myself the damage I'd done to myself making those little jokes. Because mm. I was like, no, nah, you know, I'm cool with it. But but no, so that led me down some pretty self-destructive paths. Um, so internalized your thinking, I your, think, your belittling yourself yeah, in self-destructive yeah. ways. It was, a, it was a defense mechanism to avoid myself, I guess, feeling hurt or rejected from people, especially when dating. I was 27 when I started. Yeah. I was 27 year old, gay guy, living a really good life in London, I mean, 
there's a reason I ended up HIV positive because I was living a really good life in London. I was yeah. having a lot of fun. I was having a lot of sex. I was doing a lot of drugs. I was being a 27 year old gay dude that had a really good life and a very privileged life. Um, so I used a lot of that as a you know, like, ah, oh, you don't want to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't realize that for a good 10 years that was doing some real damage on me, which I'm still working through. The internal joking. The mocking. internalized stigma was, right. is, I think, in so many ways, for me, yeah. way worse than anyone saying, ooh, I'm not going to date you, or ooh, I'm not going to So your you. internal voice was much, much harsher than the oh, outside yes. voice. Yes. That's, yes. I think, something a lot of people who watch the show can relate to. Yeah. yeah. And so important that we're aware, that we're thinking about what we're thinking about. Right. That we become mindful yeah. about the way we talk to ourselves when we're alone. Or and more and more of us are alone all the time because of social media and everything. Yeah. And, you know, I think loneliness and certainly aging with HIV yeah. is going to become more and more and more of a thing. Um, because it is easy to isolate. It is easy. And now we're just like this on our phone. So we're kind of isolating in public anyway, right? Mm -hmm. At least we used to go to bars and we used to go out and we'd be social and that's how you met people. That's all gone out the window now. So yeah. come to New York City. We're still doing. I know, I know you are. You are. <laughs> but but yes, I, I think social media is a pro and a con. I think it, you know, the exposure to more quantity of people doesn't mean we get the quality of Correct. people. Correct. But I still believe that no matter what, it's so important that we are paying attention to what we're doing in here. Mm. So much of the experience of loneliness and separation is based on our perception, not the reality. Right. Right? Because you, yes. you could be in a room with 100 people and feel lonely. Totally. Or, I, I have felt that myself. Right? Me too. Yeah. And other times we can be, if we're being mindful and loving, we can be with no other human beings in the room but feel lovingly and abundantly connected with each other mm. in the universe. Um, but it all depends on what we're perceiving and what we're thinking. Yeah. And I think that's really key in terms of managing aging and loneliness as we get older. Yeah. Um, whether we have a family or primary partner or not. Right. It's just being aware of those internal messages. But that's why I'm doing this series. But, that is, but right. that is hard to do. It's hard to do that. Well, with all the other pressures we have in our life. Work and it going back to social with being gay men talking about our bodies. Yeah. It, it, yes, I, I wish I was better at it. But you know, very much a work in progress. Here's what I would say Tell me. like any muscle in your body, mm. your mind muscles respond when we practice, when we do mental reps. If people spent 10% of the time that they spend in the gym yeah. on the way they think, on their synaptic muscles, yeah. there would be a lot more joy. I'm doing peace. curls right now. Do the curls. I'm doing curls and deadlifts in right. my brain. And I would say this, it doesn't, we don't even have to right. give it the same amount of time, but we have no qualms about people spending hours and hours and hours in the gym obsessive about their physical bodies, yes. but they won't give a fraction of that amount of time to our mind. The good news is that once you do it, like any muscle in your body, it becomes more of a habit. Mm. It does become more natural, more yeah. easy. It becomes can be part of a re regular routine, like brushing your teeth. Yes. Or taking a bath. Or taking your ARVs. Yes, taking your ARVs is when we're being mindful and kind and, and loving with within ourselves. Yeah. You know? Totally. Or or you know, being able to laugh within mm -hmm. ourselves. One of one of the exercises I practice, especially during COVID, was realizing so much time when I'm alone at home. And if I'm just doing my thing and not being mindful or right. thoughtful, I often will look in the mirror or I'll look on the Zoom screen I'll be like, why are you frowning? Do you know that's funny? You know, so I frown. I sometimes time. forget to breathe. Yeah. I'm like, so, and then I go, oh, hang on, you're not breathing. <laughs> yeah. It's like, breathe, smile. Because you don't have rich, rich resting bitch face despite what they say out there. You don't. You're a very happy person. <laughs> well, but, I mean, again, it's around people. I feel joyful most of the time. Right. But it's also important when I'm not around people. Not to be necessary. I'm not saying force happiness, but to just you know, to breathe. You and know what's helped me with that? Mm -hmm. I have to say, and again, I realize how fortunate I am to be in a position to be able to say this, is having a dog. Oh yeah, having my oh, dog. Oh my gosh, having my dog has. There's sources of love. Yes, Pure huge, love. huge change. Oh my gosh. So let so so I I love these conversations. Mm. So when did the doctor say? that they recommended you start the medication? It wasn't until I was living here in America and they discovered Carposi sarcoma yeah. in a place where the sun don't shine. The butt? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and for me, you know, that was, uh, that was probably four 
No, not for so three you years. had that three or four. Yeah, okay. it was th maybe three years after I was diagnosed, okay. and that's when it all became. That's I guess I think that's the moment where I may have sat on the floor and had a cry. I think that's the reality of when it all. Because up until that point, I didn't have. I, I just went about my life, and I was seeing the doctor every three to six months, and uh, I would go back to England primarily. I would still, I would have regular sexual health checkups. I had a, an unfortunate experience with a horrible doctor at a clinic here. Um, just won't go into it, but uh, stigmatized, but very sick. I mean, but he shouted at me and said, "Do you want to die of AIDS?" That's when he screamed at me here in Los Angeles at the LA Gay and Lesbian Center. Sorry to say that, but that's where it happened, Doctor Wang. Um, don't care, sue me. Uh, he screamed at me in front of other pa patients. Oh Do you want to die of AIDS? And I went and sat in my car and cried. Oh my and then I called my doctor in England and I said, This is, and he said, No. But you, you know, after so long of not being on treatment, things happened. And it was, I was, yeah, they discovered it. And that's when I sort of sat and probably cried for a month. Because you, then it became real. Did you know it was there? No, I was, I, no, I couldn't feel it. It was inside, I was having a full just check up on everything yeah. um, and, and that's what led to sort of a deeper probe I guess yeah. without going into too many details yeah. um, but a, a wonderful friend of mine the uh, television movie producer Dan Jinks uh, his next door neighbor was, uh, is, was a guy called Dr. Cyril Gautier who was at Cedars and I rang Dan Jinks and crying and I said I don't know what to do Dan and he said I'm calling Cyril and he and within the next morning I was in that man's office and he started me on the Gilead trial and so that was my first I went on meds that day and within weeks months chaos completely gone so, so this was like 2011 or 12? Yeah, I, I honestly, yeah. When did I move here in about 2008? I can't remember exactly. But. Now, do you remember at the time what they told you about the efficacy of the medication? No, well, I, other, no, there was no, are you getting at, did I, did they hint at U equals did U? Did they know, I mean, by, by 2011, 12, no, the we knew no, the, the data, no. but it wasn't being regularly no. talked about. No, wasn't, wasn't, I didn't okay. learn about U equals U until I came out publicly five years ago, I think it was. Was now. Mm -hmm. uh, six. Was it 2000? March six? 2018. March, I'm not good with math. I'm not good with math. I stalk you all. But no, well, yeah. thank you. You're one of the nice ones. Yes. <laughs> so, so no, I didn't know anything about it. I came out Twitter. publicly. Mm -hmm. Bruce Richmond, yes. our friend Bruce, DM'd me on Twitter and said, Can I talk to you? Do you know about this? And I said, Sure. And I said, What are you talking about? And then I went to my doctor and I said, What is this? And he said, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I listened, no crimes against my Dr. Gautier, a fantastic doctor, and he does it, he's out in Palm Springs these days, and just one of the best. Um, you know, that was the system, I guess, here in the States, but, uh, but that changed everything. As I've said, you probably heard me say this, it was the, it was like someone gave me the keys to the handcuffs that were put on me that day when I was diagnosed, and the handcuffs came off. But with that, the internalized stigma came surging to the surface. Uh, well, say more, what was Well, you, you sort of, suddenly I was, sort of, I guess, free. I felt free. I was no longer, HIV was not going to cuff me to, you know, a life of that's what it is. I could now be myself and mm -hmm. I could get out there. I was undetected when I'd been at that point undetected for years. And I could, I had to find myself again, you know? And then find, trying to find myself again, you go inside and you realize how fucked up a lot of what you thought, whether consciously or subconsciously, how screwed up it was. Uh, and the, the self-destructive behavior, that I can say that now, I used to just say, uh, oh, you know what, I'm just gonna, I, I would call it a fuck it weekend, where I would just go on a bit of a bender for a weekend. Drugs, alcohol, sex. Uh, Friday, and as long as I was done by 11 o'clock on Sunday, I'd be fine for work on Monday. Um, and I didn't think of it any more than, you know, I just have a lot of pressure in my life, and every now and then I just need to go, you know what, fuck it. I'm, why, do I, why do I always have to be the responsible one? And because I'm on television and people look at me and say, and, and, but the flip side of that is sometimes I don't want to be the responsible one. Sometimes I don't want to be the one that is, watches what he says or does the right thing. Sometimes I just want to go, fuck it. Uh, and so that's what I call that. Now, what that really was, was 
you know, throes of severe depression and self-destructive behavior um, and self-harm and not believing that I was worth more than the situations I was putting myself in. Um, and you know, I'm very fortunate that I can say that now and it's still a work in progress, but, but that was a big part of it. And, and that's what I think about, you know, how you equals you is such a, is such a life-saving transformation and we should be teaching it in schools and it should be, it just should be something that every single person knows so that you don't have to go down the path that many of us go down. Once you learned, mm -hmm. once you and Bruce had this conversation and you had the data yeah. to understand, um, you did, did it make sense? Like a lot of times people learn about you equals you and they're like, okay, I get it here, but I still don't believe it's true. No. Did you have any? No. I was a disciple immediately. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying that impacted some of the fuck it weekends. That impacted some sure. of the depression to yeah. know that you could not transmit HIV to a Yeah. Woman. And in some time, and wow. listen, yeah, no, exactly. Um, you know, I didn't, I, I, I said I was moving to America for a boyfriend that was part of coming here. Well, that crumbled before I, you know, the day I was diagnosed. And I didn't have a serious relationship, a serious relationship, again until, 2021. So from 2007 to 2021, those years have been, sorry, 2020, I, I misspeak. Mm -hmm. But from 27 to 40, as a gay man, I didn't allow myself, I couldn't, I, it, it, it just, I couldn't. I try, try, try as I may, whatever. The you barriers can, that I couldn't, I just couldn't connect intimate. with people. Well, I could be intimate, but not, I mean emotionally. Not, not, not emotionally. emotionally. Okay. Um, until a certain person came along and, you know, out of nowhere and certainly not planned. It, it, you equals you was part of that ability oh to connect with yes. him. Yes, wow. yes, yeah. Wow. Was he a person living with HIV or negative? No. Okay. And, and you know, still HIV negative. Yeah. So, so um, you were able, so this really made such an impact on your huge. mental health, your, yes. your emotional health, your ability to connect yeah. with other people. And it sounds like be kinder to yourself. Yeah, and that's why like you, I shout it from the rooftops yeah. at any opportunity I have, and that's why in Creative Plus Life, we have these conversations, much like you do, except we've got clothes on and we're not in a bathtub. Um, but hey, listen. Maybe we could start we can make a naked fire. <laughs> um, but that's why we have this, and that's why I will concert, because nobody should be made to feel how I felt, how so many people feel because of their diagnosis, that feeling of shame, not worth it, not worth it. Oh, I'm starting to prune up to mm -hmm. um, You know, not, no one should ever have to go through that. And, and if there's one thing that I will do until the day I drop dead, it is at least keep talking about it to make sure that people don't have to feel that yeah. way. Nobody, yeah. nobody deserves it. Yeah. So March 2018, mm. you post on Instagram wearing the AIDS Memorial shirt. I did, actually, and it was- Adam's Nest. Adam's Nest. And Adam has been a guest, not in this tub, but in my tub in Brooklyn, so- go And my friend, yeah. my friend whose tub we're sitting in yeah. was with me that day. Oh, He's wow. the one that said, don't do anything stupid tonight. And I think he thought I might be on my way to having a fuck it Friday. Um, and instead I wrote what I wrote, and it went viral. So March 2018. This yeah. is the Instagram post, and the link will be down below, where you came out as living with HIV and advocating you equals you on, on a grander level, in a way you had never done before. Mm -hmm. What did that feel like? I didn't really think about it, honestly. It wasn't... I, I, I had had a couple of martinis and a half a Xanax, I think. <laughs> and so... I don't. Don't try that at home. Well, no, it was if about. If you do, don't get on Instagram. Well, 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 well maybe you could get on Instagram. It was, a, it was about the T-shirt. It was about the yeah. AIDS Memorial T-shirt. Yeah. And I had these T-shirts sitting in my closet, wow. and I'd never worn it. And that day, I'd come home from work. I changed. I threw it on. I went to the Abbey to have happy hour with friends. I said to a friend, "Can you take a photo of me in this? One day, I'm going to post something." And I didn't know what I was going to post because I didn't have somebody in my life who I've lost. Um, I, you know, my mom's, this is terrible, my mom's hairdresser didn't die, but not that I know of, you know, but, but I didn't have that story. Yeah. I only have my own story. And so I don't know, it wasn't even thought about. I just, I, I was a cute picture, yeah. and I, so I went, here's the picture, and I just sort of let my fingers do the talking. And the next day, it, it, 
uh, the, when you know you're sort of you've done something when the highest highest executive of the Walt Disney Company's marketing and PR is calling you, uh -oh. and I'm going, oh no, and and then it, and my friend Chris, who he said, I told you not to do anything stupid, <laughs> uh, but you know why? Here we are. Here I am sitting at the top with you at his house. Well, what did the person, the head of the? They were very supportive. Okay. I was very lucky, you know, um, and even my. But the, the person, the general manager of ABC Los Angeles rang me and said, I just don't, you know, I don't understand. This shouldn't be a news story. And I said, I agree with you. It shouldn't be a news story, but here we are. And she retired uh, earlier this year and we were talking and I said, isn't it interesting that that thing that shouldn't be a news story is still a news story? It is still the new story. Yeah, it is. And it it's should not be. covered. I mean, the closest we even came to talking about this before you in the media was not a great circumstance, but was when Charlie Sheen came out as living with HIV. Yeah, but the, we all said he was batshit crazy. Right. And, he said, said, I and the way he did it, and he yeah. was not very specific. No. I mean, he had an opportunity there, and his partners had an opportunity because they were using PrEP. And I've had his doctor, I've had his oh. doctor on Plus Life. Yeah. Yeah, I wish that had been used more constructively. Instead, the media just sort of exploited it for a circus. But you did it in a way that conveyed dignity, um, celebration. You went on a tour. I mean, it seemed to me you were on a tour. You were on the, the Tamron Hall show, the Megyn Kelly show. You were at I, every conference. A lot of people yelled at me for going on the Megyn Kelly show. I know. And I'll say this, I thought that was brilliant. Well, I will say this about Megyn Kelly. I don't agree with her politics. Yeah. Um, I don't agree with a lot of what she says on various social platforms. But I will tell you this, I walked into that studio and they were in a commercial break and she came over to me and she hugged me and she said, thank you so much for doing this. I really, I really wanted to have this conversation with you. And I said, thank you. Yeah. And I didn't really know much about her other than the controversy that she'd come over from Fox. And she gave me an opportunity to sit down and they had a doctor in the audience. Tony, Tony Urbina. Okay, there you go, Tony, Tony. Urbina. Um, Watch him in the tub. And we got to speak to him, and everyone was like, why would you go on her show? And I was like, the, the very reason, those are the people who need to hear. Yeah. We can preach to the choir all we want. It's not going to make a difference. Yeah. But if I'm given an opportunity to, to speak to an audience that would normally go, mm-mm, uh, and she couldn't have been more gracious. So, you know, that was my personal experience yeah. with her. And it was I thought it was a great interview. Yeah. I thought it was very smart. And for all the reasons you said, it reached an audience that we don't reach otherwise. And I love doing these bathtubs, yeah. but I don't think Megan Kelly's audience is watching my bathtub show. You never show. know. Tag her. Maybe. Tag her in that post. Maybe. 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 She, would you like to sit in the tub? Oh, I would love maybe. to interview Megan Kelly. <laughs> uh, naked in the tub? Oh, yeah. Huh? She yeah. might be up Yeah, women do this, by the way. Good. Yeah. I so they should. Yeah. So they should. Yeah. Okay. So this brought a whole new level to your message, to the power of your message, the energy of your message. I don't mean to be rude, but I never heard of you before. But then I was like, oh, okay, wow, this guy's amazing. I'm, I'm following all your interviews. What yeah. was that like for you to, to be generating that kind of energy and attention in this way? Um, I don't know, because I don't really, it's going to sound weird, but I don't really think about it like that. Uh -huh. It's sort of like just get on with it. Um, and I know the noise is out there, um, and, and as I said, most 99% of the time it's been lovely noise. Uh -huh. um, but I think, and this goes back to growing up with a very famous brother and just sort of being around noise like this, that sort of energy. Uh, I don't give it too much thought, to be honest. It's uh -huh. sort of, it's there and I know it's there and I don't really think about it. Um, Do you ever feel pressure? Uh, yeah, but I think a lot of the pressure I feel is pressure I put on myself, you know? I am a perfectionist. I don't, I don't like getting things wrong or screwing up, but I'm the, also the first to admit that I screw up a lot and I get things wrong a lot. And that's a good thing, because you don't learn from always being right. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to be a little kinder, going back to what you said, to be a little kinder to myself. But n no, that's a hard one to answer, David. I think I felt pressure in that I don't, yeah, I don't like screwing up. I don't like, I don't want to ever hurt anybody's feelings or, or make somebody uncomfortable. And sometimes I'm capable of that, just because I think being a little too honest um, and a little direct sometimes can be confronting for some people, can be intimidating. 
and sometimes it can sort of hurt people's feelings a little bit. And that I, that's maybe when I feel a bit of pressure on myself to just like, you don't always have to, you don't always have to open your mouth. You don't always have to. And then the flip side of that is, well, fuck it. If I don't, who the hell is going to? Yeah. So it's a double-edged sword. Okay. And sometimes things need to be said. Sometimes things need yeah. to be said. Exactly. If you could go back to 2018 to mm -hmm. that Instagram post and do anything different, would you have made any other decisions or said anything differently or not opened no. your mouth? Or no, yeah. I would have done exactly the same Good. thing. Good. Okay. And it's funny. I've spoken to quite a few people, um, celebrity and not celebrity. Uh -huh in their process of wanting to come out and talk publicly about their status. Um, and you know, oh, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I'm like, that's great, that works for you. There was no agenda with me. There was no plan, this was not planned. This was emotional and just a couple of martinis and a Xanax and off I went. I, think, I really didn't think about it too much. And I think maybe that's perhaps why it resonated in the way that it did because if you read it, it is, just really authentic um, and I try my best when I do stuff like this or doing my own stuff to be as authentic as I, you know there's there's a lot of people that would probably say why are you bringing up the fuck it Fridays and the drugs you shouldn't talk about that you want to keep a job on career on television and network television yes I wouldn't mind still working there but also let's stop pretending this is part of where the stigma and the shame of everything comes from um, it, you know what it's silly, so, and also, it makes me a happier person to be as authentic as I can. Yes. I, we're not, not gonna ask you too many questions about what you shared mm -hmm. about surviving sexual assault. Yeah. But is there anything that you would want to share or guidance you'd want to give to somebody who's watching this who might be coping with a similar thing or, or it's trying to figure out what to do with that experience as an adult. Look, it's very difficult. I think everyone's situation is different. I, my approach to my uh, sexual assault and being sexualized at a very young age, I've sort of, I, I have a rather controversial view on it in the sense that when you're three years old and your big brother's best friend says, let's play this game, you go, great, okay, yes. And it's not until you get to five or six when you're in school and they start saying, where did the man touch you, and that's bad, that you go, wait, what, hang on, so that game that I thought was fun, and certainly not at not all times felt good, trust me, but there were times when I was like, oh, cool, wait, that's all bad, and, and I liked some of it, some of the time, so I'm bad, and, and then you come to realize, your sexuality, and then, so, you know, it, that's, that's confusing. I, it, more upsetting for me is, you know, to be 24, 25 and be raped by a person, drugged and raped, um, and it, this is sort of only, I've only just started talking about this recently, and the person, I, I thought the person was dead, I thought the person had died, so I sort of let it go and it was just what it was. And then a couple of months ago, I got a phone call from my brother telling me that the person who did it was still very much alive um, and working in close proximity to my brother. And this man is a very famous man in Australia. And he is very well connected to a very famous Australian movie director who's made some great movie musicals and movies about famous singers. Uh, and this man, who was very closely aligned with this, that director, um, drugged me and raped me. And so I, just in the last few months, gone through the process of going to the police and reporting it. And only a few weeks ago, the police in Australia called me and they said, yeah, we can't really do anything with this. So I know that this man is still alive and is still moving in circles around young gay men who want to further their careers in the industry and no doubt still very much a predator. So I'm dealing with that right now. I'm trying to process that because my rapist is still alive and still very much in close proximity with men who were my age when he drugged me and raped me. So it's a hard one. Everyone's journey and story is different and I'm still in the process of figuring it out. Thank you for sharing. Of course. How are you processing that right now? Uh, I don't, it's a sort of, I think about it times and then I don't think about it. I've done a lot of writing. I've, I've started writing a lot and that helps. 
just right purging it out which I guess goes back to the Instagram post it was that same thing you know I just let my fingers do the talking and out that out, out my HIV story came and so I think you know who knows maybe I'll share the story in finer detail with the publication one day um, and the police in Australia were very apologetic they're like look this happened 20 something years ago it's you says versus he says and I said and now I knew that I was like look I know I said but I have to, knowing that he is alive, I have to do everything in my power so I know that I've done what I could. Yeah. And, and then I, short of naming and shaming, which okay. then opens me up to all kinds of lawsuits. And this man is still very powerful in Hollywood as well. And yet, and we don't, talk, we don't talk about that too much. We don't talk about men being raped by men. Mm. You don't. But we've gone way off topic. Way off topic. Mental health and, and yes. wellness. And I thank you. I really thank you for sharing this and being mm. vulnerable. Uh, Let's finish this on a bright note, okay, okay. Just thinking that you are not the uncertain, you're not the only person. No, if, and, that, and, that's, speak and, that's what, and that's and that's the conundrum. Yeah. Do I now go rather public and risk literally being sued? Um, but I, I'm sure I'm not there. And the police were even like, "Look, if there were more people," and I'm like, "Well, how do we get there if you anyway?" So, okay, that's that. Okay, so let's thank you. Of course. If you, uh, let's just go and talk about what's going on in your life too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you just got back from the International AIDS Society Conference. Yes. What's happening in the world? What's ha what's exciting to you in the U equals U world today? What well, changes are happening, and what do you think is going to move us forward? Well, we're talking about it a lot more, and we're continuing to. And I think people. And the theme of this year's conference was put people first. Yeah. And I think people are getting angry, and rightfully so, that this information is not getting through to people, especially here in the United States. You look at the success of you equals you in countries like Vietnam, and, and you know, they're hitting their 95, 95, 95 targets. America is- Can you say what that is? So, I, and I don't want to miss it. It's 95% tested, 95% on treatment, is it? I think so, yeah. And 95% undetectable. Right. Um, and that's, look, we have the tools to end HIV. Yeah. So, but we have a lot of work to do in this right. country. And the frustration is, why is, what makes sense to you and I not getting through to other communities and it, 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 it's there's so much it's it's racism and it's you know with the history of this country and all kinds of things but again I think it just all starts with a conversation so the U equals U it was energizing to be around so many people from around the world who are dedicated to making sure people know about this what would you like to see happen in the United States to shift this trajectory? Well, I'd say it like this, you know, um, Nike has a slogan, just do it, uh -huh. right? And uh, it, mm, I'm loving it as McDonald's. And L'Oreal, she's worth it, uh -huh. okay? I know that, uh -huh. you know that. Everyone knows these slogans. Um, but we may not wear Nike, and I don't, I don't wear L'Oreal, and I don't always eat McDonald's, but I know these slogans, and I think we need to get to a point with U equals U, that is so, it, it's just so, it's such an easy, simple, cheap message that you just know what that means, yeah. right? And so that's communicated to everybody. So you just know it. You just mm -hmm. know it like you know to put your seatbelt on in the car. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we need to do, and, and that's what, people like you do and people like I do and advocates at grassroots level. Government needs to do a hell of a lot more. Um, but that's another hour and the bathroom is going to come. Okay. What gives your life meaning and purpose today? Oh, that's a good question. My dog. Yeah. <laughs> My dog Gus gives me. Um, no, it's, you know, I, I know I said at the, at the top of our bath that it's not something that I sit and really think about in that when I do what I do. Oh, I'm changing people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when I do take a moment to sit and think about what I and the team at Plus Life have created um, and my colleagues at ABC who have supported and given me a voice and a platform, um, that, that knowing that, you know, and the messages I get from people all over the world. You know, we had some guy in Pakistan who watches our videos literally on his phone in the closet so that no one can hear and watch wow. it. Um, and when people go, you know, hopefully one day I can be like, have the courage to do what you did. That's, that's pretty 
How does that feel to you? It's very nice. Thank okay. You. So thank you, Carl. Thank, thank you for taking time. People want to follow you, your work, mm -hmm. see what you're talking about, sure. what you're doing, what's the best way, and we'll put the links down below. At Carl J. Schmidt uh -huh. and at Plus Life Media. Beautiful. Thank you for having Beautiful. me on the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, taking the time. Thank and, you. and thank you for being an example for me, for the community. And I think people watching this are like, well, he's amazing, but I'm not on TV and I can't do what he does. I want to say that all of us have a role in helping our world become a happier, healthier place. And yes. sometimes we do at that moment, with you, the tools you have, this is all I've done, this is what Bruce Richmond did, was just saying, this is where I am today. This is the change I want to see, and I just start taking action. Everybody watching this is in a position to do something to make their community a happier, healthier, more pleasurable place. Amen. Right. Thank you, Damon. Thank you. And thank you for what you do. Oh, hey. I love being naked and sitting in bathtubs. Why not? So, <laughs> all right, folks. If you like this, there's three full seasons of Tub Talks with Damon. Hours. Filmed around hours. the world. Uh, with amazing advocates and people who are helping me learn and understand how to be a better person and age with, with more joy and pleasure. And you do it so well. Thank you. Well. I'm excited about that. So if you want to see them, subscribe down below, watch Tub Talks with Damon. All of them are on YouTube. And if you are moved or share this, if you don't like this interview, share it with someone you don't like. But if you like it, share yeah. it with someone you do like. Sure. And keep the conversation going and we will be, I think, in a better place. Thank you, my dear. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, amazing. All right. Thank you, too. Thanks, everybody.